He said, but I am not going to stop here. We actually should now develop and we both agreed that we should actually do something for AI for the software defined life cycle and AI for product development life cycle and AI for digital manufacturing and these three should cut across all segments or all verticals at that time, right? One thing led to another. Today, we've got more than 150 patents filed for AI by LTTs. Six months ago, I had, we had, uh, we had, we were running some 50 POCs out of which only 30% were paid, 70 were unpaid. Today, I've got paid engagements, teams running, supporting our customers and AI is a revenue generator for the end up, for the organization. Hi, wherever you're joining us, I hope you're doing well. Welcome to Tech Conversations, where we bring you insights from tech entrepreneurs, CXOs, and investors. I'm Hari Arakli, and in this episode, Amit Chadha, CEO and MD at Larson & Tubro Technology Services, gives us a quick update on the company's progress after a recent reorganization along three large opportunities. And he talks about how each of those businesses can become a billion dollar operation. In this conversation, Amit, who's based in the US, also talks about the sentiment among his biggest customers on technology spending, the impact of generative AI on the engineering services industry, and how AI is indeed a source of new revenue for LTTS. This interview was recorded on August 26th during Amit's visit to the company's Bengaluru R&D campus. Amit, thank you so much for making time to do this. Really sure. looking forward to this uh, conversation. Thank you so much for coming out. All right. So for a general audience, uh, maybe you could start us off with a brief introduction to yourself. Um, and we'll also get into l and technology services. I know that uh, you're a technologist for a very long time, close to 30 years in the industry. Sure. I would like to hear in your own words, give us a snapshot and we'll go from there. Sure. Um, so I uh, grew up uh, in the eastern part of India uh, huh. in a city called Jamshedpur, a very industrial town. Uh, and uh, my father uh, uh, was employed at that point of time with Tata Steel. And um, one thing led to another, but there's a lot of engineering talent, a lot of engineering know-how, a lot of engineering marvel uh, in Tata Steel, in, in Jamshedpur. Uh, went to BIT Mesra. Um, and um, um, and uh, uh, did electronics and electrical engineering there. Engineering has been very close to my heart because you know at the end of it, when there's change in the world, I do believe that, uh, and I'm not discounting IT, but I do believe that engineering actually makes things happen. So if you have a vision, whether it be to make an automot automotive car or you know make a truck or uh, even a uh, uh, a robo or whatever, it all requires engineering. Uh, so it's always been very, very, uh, 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 shall I say, I've been very passionate about it. Mm. I remember, sorry, but I, I remember growing up, you know, the first engineering project that I did was actually taking a motor and a bulb and connecting it to these questions and answers, right? You used to do when you'd, you'd get the right question, uh, right answer and the bulb will glow or the motor will go up and gave so much thrill. There used to be these kits. So my father had traveled abroad and he had brought back a kit from Germany uh, and that had all this. So a lot of excitement. I used to play with Lego and, and it's just one thing to another. I'm very passionate about it. Can you give us a brief uh, background or maybe like a history of uh, LTTS? And sure. How sure. you came to join the company as well? Sure, sure. So, so it was 2009, uh, and at that point of time, uh, uh, LNT had engineering being done across four different business units in the company. And the chairman at that time, Chairman Nayak, uh, had the vision that uh, he thought that engineering services could potentially reach where IT services was at that point of time. Uh, so he approached some of us, and uh, our previous CEO and I joined uh, LNT as part of a management rejig that he was bringing on. And uh, <clears throat> he gave us a vision, uh, get to a half a billion dollars. And um, um, so we started, uh, we looked at what were the uh, spend patterns in the industry. 
we established uh, the auto and aero verticals. Uh, today, they are our fast-moving verticals. At that point of time, uh, they used to be loss-making to start with. We were investing, right, all along. And uh, <coughs> uh, so that was one major change that we brought about. Second was we decided that uh, there were spent geographies in the US, parts of Europe and Japan. And we said these are the only three areas we'll focus on. And we invested in a sales engine. I joined as the head of market. So uh, in that role, uh, sales expenses in the first year were like 15, 18% of revenue. Uh, but the l and uh, uh, management did not flinch at all and said, you know, go on, you're building a future, right? Don't worry. Uh, and the third thing we did was, and one thing led to another, we, we moved forward, we got to about a half a billion dollars and we realized that technology was changing and we needed to have a, a pole position if we were to go forward. So we established a CTO office. And the CTO office's mandate was not to generate any revenue. The only mandate was to look at the future and tell us what technology should we start focusing on. At that point of time, I was also progressing through the organization in different roles. Uh, so the board turned around and said, why don't you take responsibility for building the digital engineering capabilities for the company? So, <clears throat> so I did a complete valuation and I realized that uh, when you talk about digital engineering, it's not just uh, software, there's hardware, there's silicon engineering, etc. So we did uh, two acquisitions uh, to shore up our capabilities and VLSI design capabilities, SEMCON capabilities, one in, Europe, one in uh, San Francisco and one in Bangalore. Uh, we then realized that we didn't have capabilities in 5G. So we went ahead and, you know, we took on an acquisition of a, 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 a company in Dallas, Texas. Uh, they, had, they had some IP, etc. that we bought, we took over that. And, uh, and then I was named deputy CEO. And at that point of time, we were going through a tough time. COVID was not good for, for us. Um, we had lost some people. More importantly, uh, client spends changed. And the first time in our history, we actually declined in revenues. Margins came down. Um, I think at that point of time, I'd just taken over as deputy CEO. And uh, so our CEO as well as the board said, why don't you start thinking about how would you like to run this and this agenda, take it forward. And uh, I turned around, I did what I always do. I'm an engineer at heart. So I said, we have to break this down to the lowest common denominator. So I sent out Spur of the moment, Sunday evening, sitting down. I remember those days you could not even move out of your house also, right? Sunday evening, I, I sent about 200 messages to people in the company, analysts, clients. I still remember about 5 p.m. in the evening or went on till 9 and I was typing out, sending out messages saying, appreciate your support. I hope you, you and your, your next in, you know, your, your kin are fine. If you're thinking about the LTTS of the future, what would you like us to be and what would you like us to change? Right? And uh, out of those 200 odd emails I sent, I got about 180 responses. I spoke to about 120 people. Couldn't travel, so on video, 120 uh, video interviews. And what came out of all that was that we needed to define a larger purpose. And out of that came out our vision, mission, and values. And then we came to behaviors from there. Second thing that, that came out as feedback and that we took forward was, life cannot only be top line, bottom line. There should be input dimensions and output dimensions. So our input dimensions we defined for ourselves were technology, people, clients. Our output dimensions were top line and bottom line. And ESG was our I will call it our sanity dimension. So we created a six dimensional framework for our decisions. And then we said we are a technology company. We have to take technology bets. You just can't say you are a technology company. You don't have bets. What do you have then? So we took six bets. And after we took the bets, and again it took time. This was chain management. This was around which year? This is 2000. Now I'm discussing 2021. Uh, move from, right? Um, so, 21, and then we turned around, we did a lot of change management. One of the things, that, so I had gone to NCR, and one of the things I learned from there was in an organization for us to be successful, you need to have the right change management. So we did that. 
and all internal, right? And um, and we started on that journey, right? Uh, so that I should say was LTTS 2.0. <coughs> and uh, in the last three years, you uh, had a CAGR of more than 15%. We've gone from 750 odd million dollars to about 1.2 billion dollar run rate as a company, gone from about 17, 18,000 people to about 27,000 people now. Uh, established proper centers. The one thing that I'm most proud about personally, right, um, is the fact that we've gone from filing 50 patents for ourselves and our customers per year to now filing 50 patents for ourselves and our customers every quarter. And that gives me immense pleasure. I mean, if you go tour the floor, you talk to our employees, mm -hmm. the number of inventors that are there, the number of patent holders that are there, it truly excites me to think that, you know, this is possible and in a very quick period of time. Can you bring it uh, to this year, um, the last three to six months, what have been some of the most important developments, initiatives at the company? Sure. So so what we've done is, so, so again, when we announced the vision mission values, the dimension framework and the, and the, uh, and the six beds, I had shared at that time that my, uh, our vision was that the vision mission values of the company will be a 10 year cycle. Right? We'll refresh it at the end of 10 years and should be something that should last for a decade, right? Because values can't be changed so quickly, right? And they're very important. Second, we said this, the dimensional glide path that we had, six dimensional glide path is a, about a five year horizon. Then we'll see at that point of time what the company needs more or less and all that. And the bets we had said were a three year horizon. Now, if I look back in the last six, nine, 12 months, clients have clearly gone to value creation here and now. So is a activity, forget projects or anything, is an activity creating value for me? Yes, no. Is it adding to my top line? Is it helping my bottom line? It is helping my employee experience in any way or client experience. And if it's not one of those four, I don't want to do it right now. So that's one reality that's come. The money is tighter than it was. Markets are tight, right? So, so that's one reality that's come. Second, and there are two sides to this. One, clients are extremely pleased to listen to new ideas as long as they can connect to one of these imperatives that they've got. The second thing is that technology cycles are changing. And technology cycles are changing in three-year terms now. It's no longer a five-year technology cycle change. You look at it, there was, there was, there was a lot... Digital, it was connected, and then there was a lot of video conferencing all of a sudden, and everything uh, went went virtual. And now, if I look at it, everybody is talking AI and Gen AI, right? So it's changing. And the third thing is that employees want to do more with a purpose. So with that said, we started thinking: How do we reorganize? so that one, we can be closer to the customer. Second, we can be contextual to the customer. Generic conversations do not work, right? I mean, I want to go play golf with you. I would love to, you know, have tea with you is great, but that's five minutes. It's content that matters, right? And I will hazard and say this as much, go on a limb and say, 20 years ago, there was a lot of general management and that could work. In our business today, it is specific management. If you are not able to talk about in mobility, let's say you can't go talk about software. So if I go meet a mobility client. I am not able to talk about software defined vehicles or I'm not able to talk about how Gen AI will impact it. Or let's say I'm going and meeting a, 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 a discrete manufacturing customer and I can't talk about software defined machines or I can't talk about platforms. I will not get a second meeting, right? So you have to be specific. So we, we looked at all of this and what we said was that therefore we will have to go deeper if you're going to be able to do something with this. So <clears throat> one, second we realized that about $1.2 billion it was time to start looking at the next uh, uh, you know, evolution for ourselves. So broadly with all this said what we did was we have now reorganized to three segments, mobility, sustainability, tech. Mobility is auto, aero and trucks, commercial vehicles, all that. Sustainability is uh, process and discrete manufacturing. 
and tech is med tech and high tech three segments and three technology areas so software defined everything and ai embedded systems and vlsi design services and manufacturing uh, digital manufacturing solutions right so we have simplified the organization structure we've also elevated people internally into these roles so we don't have to externally hunt and get people for these roles and having done that we want each one of these segments that we want you to imagine yourself at a billion dollars because broadly these are about 400 million dollars each each segment mm. is it think about yourselves as a billion dollars what does it take so again we reorganized uh, we we brought everybody on and uh, uh, again the culture of the company is to take everybody along do from within it's it's a shall i say it's an lnt thing it's an ltts thing right uh top down doesn't work right so feb march i was in uh, india for two months uh, march and april and i toured all our facilities met all our uh, our managers met our employees um I started to give sound bites about mobility sustainability tech i got feedback um uh, on what it means for to them etc so we built this whole thing and we reorganized we re we announced the organization structure effective first of april we brought everybody all the entire leadership council was brought into lonavla for 3 days we spent time together answered questions queries because they were finally going to go face the employees and customers one thing to another uh, we also gave them a charter and again this is something that i've learned over a period of time that when you're giving people a a a, a way forward uh, give a pro- provide provide a direction provide a target and then work towards it it works so the question that i asked them after the session was that are you happy and pleased with what you know you've seen and resounding answer was we know why you you're saying we should do this we agree with you on board right up and onward and then now my question to you is that i want you to take 60 days because you're all practitioners that have come come in through this i want you to define your north star i want you to define what mobility wants to needs to be will be known for what sustainability will be known for what tech will be known for 60 days i would love an answer back from you and then give me a, let's have a game plan 60 days after that and we'll execute <clears throat> and we we said that and and investments we had actually agreed to investments in february and we went to the market also and we said that we are reorganizing there will be investment required we'll do that 5 months in the six bets have double clicked now into 18 strategic areas across the three segments these 18 areas are now being worked on in some cases we have built the stacks in other cases the stacks are being built um we will we will take you around and we'll show you some of the stuff we've done so we are launching our own software defined vehicle uh, digital stack i think we'll announce it in a couple three days and we will we will launch it so clients can use it on a paper use basis right um <clears throat> ev lab has been expanded uh hybrid hybrid and ev has been expanded we have taken over uh, facilities in osberg in germany uh for hydrogen uh transmission we've got ev right here in bangalore as well as in um, other parts of india as well as peoria in in the us so again expanded vehicle engineering has been expanded if i take an example of semiconductor uh, we we are now working on 3 nanometer 5 nanometer on and on right if i take uh, 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 you know one thing that people used to tell us was you're not into digital so in digital uh, platform engineering is a clear practice that has been established and um, <clears throat> some of the hyperscalers are customers and significant clients for us now so we have deliberately made those investments on the west coast to the us to be able to do that right we are seeing industrial discrete industrial customers uh, spending a lot more money on platforms and platformization <laughs> so we are we have created an offering in that area uh, of course because of uh, supply chains uh, de- becoming a lot more localized there's a lot of action happening in cpg industry in the oil industry in the gas industry so that part of the business is also growing for us so all in all 18 areas for the six or three segments and the goal is to be able to get each of the segments to a billion dollars at different points of time 
as a result of uh, the reorganization any early uh, instances examples of marquee customers where you have permission to talk about them who have decided to engage you in a more higher value added way yes so thank you so much for asking that <clears throat> early validation and we continue to look for validation right i I'm, i'm actually if i i don't so i believe that no feedback is not good feedback i would love for people to give give us feedback so we can learn we can change we can continue to evolve right so one uh, early days uh, we got very positive uh, uh, reinforcement from <coughs> uh, from <coughs> a us based oem that empaneled us uh, for software defined work and activities we've already been able to build about uh, a 200 member team for them and growing right um second was that uh, a european oem uh, uh, tier 1 which is in automotive forvia actually uh, announced that they were partnering with ltts for hybrid uh, transmission uh, and uh, uh, transferred some of the people we took on work um, and we have recently expanded the relationship with them as well and this is a new customer right so validation from their standpoint uh, thales just announced uh, with us uh, a go to market for digital uh, information and security services again they've been a long standing customer they love what we're doing and i i i thank them humbled uh, by by the feedback that was that then in the in the in the uh, sustainability space uh, you've seen announcements we have made with bp last year uh, and that team size now is more than 100 north of 100 people now and and growing um, uh, shell has announced a new contract uh, signature with us uh in taking forward and working with us in uh, projects engineering we, we used to work with them in digital engineering so that's been a plus for us so that's that's a sustainability uh, uh shall i say segment uh, that's provided us positive feedback uh and on the tech side uh we've actually <coughs> gone uh, uh gone very aggressive in 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 evolving an ecosystem approach Uh, so Palo Alto announced uh, uh, a partnership with us for digital manufacturing. Uh, we've also announced going uh, going forward on AI in our journey with Nvidia, uh, with um, GCP as well and AWS. So those are some of the things that we've announced recently to the public domain, and uh, the feedback has been fairly positive to to us uh, as as we've engaged with our clients. In fact, last week I was talking with the chief operating officer of one of our top medtech accounts. and uh, he was telling me he said amit uh, we need to build a much bigger relationship he is one of our top 5 accounts much a build much bigger relationship and and we were truly happy with the quality of delivery and the uh, pace of innovation see when we are filing 50 patents for per quarter broadly it's 25 for customer owned patents and 25 broadly are our own patents so it's enriching the client as well and that's what they see in ltts as a differentiated technology company or organization are uh, bringing innovation to their do step mm. and you have articulated a go deep to achieve scale go uh, deeper to scale strategy i mean simple so the english language meaning is kind of apparent that if you build more expertise you probably get better deals but we want to kind of hear it you know how you in your own words uh, how you came up with this idea and what it's actually translating to in terms of uh, how your customers are now beginning to look at you sure see go deeper to scale comes from a fundamental belief that as an engineering and technology company we need to have technical mastery hmm. and you need to have technical mastery on the subject that you've got and you need to understand it completely so i'll give an example what 12 months ago i called our cto up and i said that um, so we established something called a client advisory council mm-hmm. and this is 16 odd uh, clients uh, that have uh, so nicely agreed to be part of this we met twice last year it was the first year last year we were meeting one time onwards from this year onwards so we got a professor from one of the top us uh, universities to come and talk about ai and there been a lot of buzz on ai over 9 months i'm talking about 9 12 months ago right 12 months ago 
So our CTO was there, I was there, our president for mobility and CMT was there in the room, and regions were there in the room, and Samir and others were there, our CMO. And um, so the professor talked about the fact that it was not just data, right? And he talked about applications and data. So after the session was over, I, we actually sat down with him and I said, I said, Professor, I have an alternative point of view. Don't you think compute is important? He said, very important. I said, don't you think connect is important? He said, very important. I said, great. For the conversation we ended, came back, I met, uh, you know, uh, spent time with Ashish before he flew back from the US. I said, Ashish, <clears throat> let's not look at only data or applications. Let's build a four layer architecture for AI. Hardware, software, data, and governance or cyber. Right? So make it a four layer approach rather than a one layer approach. He said, let me think. I said, fine. So he came back to India, he talked to our teams, etc. Then we engaged some of the segment heads because everybody's an engineer, right? And um, uh, and um, and about two weeks he said, Look, I'm I'm willing to have a conversation, I'm ready. So okay. So he said, This is how we'll go about AI. We'll build out AI. Uh, so first of all, AI will not be only data for us. AI will be hardware, software, data, and cyber or, or governance, right? Governance and, and, and cyber. Second, he said we will look at uh, uh, we will look at mobility, sustainability, and tech. And at that time, we were calling it the other verticals earlier name. So he said we'll call it the vertical by vertical. I will go at it and I'll develop use cases for each vertical, for manufacturing and engineering. So, manuf so, so we said AI is broadly engineering, manufacturing and enterprise. We will not focus on enterprise. It will be only engineering and manufacturing. And then for each vertical, we will build out use cases. So great. He said, but I am not going to stop here. We actually should now develop, and we both agreed that we should actually do something for AI for the software defined life cycle. And AI for product development life cycle and AI for digital manufacturing and these three should cut across all segments or all verticals at that time, right? One thing led to another. Today, we've got more than 150 patents filed for AI by LTTS. Six months ago, I had, we had, uh, we had, we were running some 50 POCs out of which only 30% were paid, 70 were unpaid. Today, I've got paid engagements, teams running, supporting our customers, and AI is a revenue generator for the end up, for the organization. Now, where will this go? What will happen? To be seen. But I believe that that's the level of detailing that we are willing to go to and the conversations we are willing to have. Mm -hmm. For example, we've got, uh, we've got a uh, investor analyst day coming up. And uh, yesterday in the evening, uh, you know, they said, why don't we look at the pods? And I said, fine, I, you know, I'm happy to tour the floor. It was supposed to be a 60 minute thing. We ended up spending two and a half hours and I still think that they pushed me out. I could have done another half an hour and had a conversation. When you talk engineer to engineer, it's a whole different level of conversation. Grades, roles don't matter. At the end of it, one of my early managers had told me that this industry is not about who's senior, who's junior. This industry is a knowledge industry. And that's what matters. The excitement. So we built a aluminum uh, cell. And they took a video as well. I was, you know, I was worried about, I'll fall off the bike. They, they were actually powering a bike with it. And I toured on a bike on the whole floor. I was worried I'll fall off and I'll make a fool of myself. But outside of that, I mean, the... I was so proud of seeing it. Six months ago, I was here in Bangalore. I saw it as a small cell and I told them, why don't you take it forward? They said, yes. I said, what else can you do? He said, we'll power cells. a bike. Sorry? This is aluminum fuel this cell. This is aluminum fuel cell. Okay. And I said, I said, what else can you do? They said, we can, uh, we can, little fan motor. I said, this is not impressive. And the lady there said, we will, we will run aluminum. We will use this fuel cell to run a bike. Next time you're here. I said, how are you sure I'm back? How soon will I be back? He said, Amit, you come back in six months, we'll have it. They have it. Amazing. Right? Um, industrial application. So we keep talking about alternative energy, etc. We bought a floor cleaner from the market 
and converted the entire power supply from gasoline to electric, hybrid electric, whatever. And now we are working on trying to convert that to hydrogen fuel. So that's the kind of stuff that keeps you motivated. And when our clients come and visit us and they see stuff like this, <coughs> we are doing this why? Look, all our intent is we will never be a products company. We are not in the market to become a manufacturing organization. We are an engineering services organization. We are happy in that. But what we want to be known for is our technology powers. And that will only happen if we go deeper. And then, you know, now you got this tagline, go deeper to scale. Yeah. In fact, I'm going to add to that and tell you, we are now talking about purposeful, agile engineering. Mm -hmm. Right? And that's what we want to stand for and want to be known for. Can you talk about this a bit more? Um, especially if you look at your European customers. So, so number one, um, Europe is an important geography. Truth be told, my first two years... Uh, three years as CEO, I ended up, first year I was home because it was still COVID. I took over as CEO in DC. Uh, but the second year and third year, my first April, which was my first day of the year, or first week of the year was in Europe. Right? Europe, we fortified from the standpoint that look, <clears throat> so we had, so if I step back, we believe that the spends that are happening now, they will be spent that will continue to happen in Europe as a geo and grow. Right? A lot of positivity for India. A lot of positivity for India. Second, we believe that areas of automotive in Europe, hyperscalers and high-tech ISVs in the US and medtech in the US are three areas where we should invest and grow. Because that, those will give good returns, right? And we have tried our hands at MA. We continue to, you know, look at different points at different. Uh, uh, but we are not waiting for an MA. So, without waiting for an MA, we established a Poland center. Today it's about 100 people. We've established a center in Munich, <laughs> more than 250, 300 people. We established a center in uh, Toulouse. We, we, we established a center in Gothenburg. Now there's a hundred engine in Osberg. So we, we truly believe that if Europe has to grow, it has to be global, global yet local. Right? So one center is established. Second, <coughs> uh, 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 in-country sales engine, relationship engine, as well as people with subject matter expertise, subject matter experts there. But once you have a delivery center, you will have all this. Third, we have targetedly solicited clients that we did not have who are big spenders. And we've added those. We've also deepened our relationships. And that is very clear and apparent. In And, and, and finally, we've had work come to us in digital manufacturing, which is uh, digital twin, digital thread. We've had work come to us in plant process engineering. So working with people like Shell, which we announced, BPB announced, as well as CPG customers uh, that we've got. Uh, third, working with automotive OEMs and tier ones in the region. And a lot of these industrial customers around high-end embedded electronics engineering. So all that put together, if you ask me, the results have been that Europe has grown faster for us in the last two years than the company average. Yeah. And I am confirming that current year also Europe will grow faster for us than the company average without an acquisition. Mm. Right? But we continue to look at, uh, actively look at, um, at um, uh, you know, avenues to acquire <coughs> companies if we can find them. Mm. And we will continue to, that's a continuous process for us. What are some areas where today you might be getting maybe like a pilot project kind of contract? I mean, I think after first quarter, you told us that in AI, you're getting revenue generating contracts. Yes, sir. Um, similarly, in, in sustainability, and I think you've mentioned in plant engineering, uh, there, are, there are projects that you're doing, which has an impact in terms of sustainability. Uh, I just want to get a better sense of really promising work Today, that might be small nascent initiatives at LTTS, 
but in the five years, ten years horizon, which could be really huge uh, for you. So on the for sustainability, uh, we are working on a number of projects on energy transition. So people are are moving from oil to gas, and uh, people are moving to uh, to a lot of renewables, if I may. And we are getting involved in projects uh, to execute and and make that change. We are also engaged with windmill manufacturers. We are we are involved with companies that make solar panels to do engineering design, redesign, value engineering for them. In fact, uh, our uh, uh, some of our customers are getting us involved to talk about um, uh, blade batteries, right? So we actually uh, did a reverse engineering on on a particular OEM uh, uh, <coughs> uh, car, automotive uh, car. And we figured out that they were into uh, blade batteries, which is helping them reduce um, uh, reduce the weight as well as improve throughput, etc. So there's a lot of work that's going on in that area uh, that you got. In fact, this uh, engagement with Forvia as well is uh, is around hydrogen and energy in, in Europe, right? That we're doing. Um, <clears throat> now we are also so energy transitions one. Second is working on sustainability projects, so zero liquid discharge projects in progress. We are working on uh, lower energy consumption uh, work that's going on uh, at the plant level, right? Uh, that we are working on. Uh, we are also working on uh, circularity, product circularity, if I may, in the medtech area. So there is a lot of these products that we develop for medtech that where the the material that we use. Uh, should no longer should be recyclable, etc. So a lot of that work has been happening with us as well. So so those are some of the things that we are doing in sustainability in Europe, and not just the not just Europe. We are also doing it in the US. So medtech, the work I talked about, is is actually happening for a US client or three US clients actually. Right. Um, so product circularity is a big thing. In fact, if you will look at the UN goals, right on on the sustainability charter. Six of those are relevant to us, including climate action, right? And we have mapped our services to those, and we are taking it forward. I mean, to the extent that you are comfortable with it, can you give us a sense of the size of the contracts? So, <clears throat> for we have we announced was about fifty million dollars. Um, Shell, we haven't put a number to it, but it is a top twenty-five account for the company and growing. Um, and um, if I look at the other work that we're doing, these are all in excess of, uh, I mean, all the work that we're doing, right? The liquid discharge plant uh, that we that we are engineering uh, is is worth more than ten million dollars of water value for us. So these are fairly substantial. I mean, these are not those hundred k, two hundred k's, and all that. Mm. There will be hundred k, two hundred k's that will happen, right? Mm. But there will be a lot of these are in that million dollar range, five million range that we will continue to execute. Mm. See, and the whole idea is. In our business, we may start with a project, but that's not my end goal. My end goal is to build a relationship, and mm. there, then you get multiple projects and repeatable projects that can be done. For example, for a CPG major, we talked about and we said that we will get involved and we will lower energy consumption in six plants for them in the U.S. And we help them with ideas, etc., and redid some of the engineering design. And then now we are we got involved with them globally. So all their plants globally were a copy and paste in terms of the model that and templates that we had built, mm -hmm. right? So that's a repeatable uh, engagement that that you got going on, and that becomes like a ten plus million account for you for the period because you continue to do multiple plants. So mm -hmm. that's our goal to to do that. See, sustainability for us is about a third of the company revenue today. In different parts, I'm hmm. in mean, different kinds of work. Hmm. Can you drill down into this on the business side of things? Um, how are business models changing? How are ways in which customers are willing to pay you? How is that changing? Because yeah. in the tech services industry today, there is so much talk about delivering outcomes. I just want to get a sense of, in reality, to what extent you all are able to. Build customers, ask them for more money where you're delivering higher value and things like that. Sure. So look, fundamentally, if you look at a business like ours, we've got three stakeholders: investors, customers, employees, and then a stakeholder as society. Right? We have to work where we can 
<coughs> be fair to all our three stakeholders. So a number of our contracts that we execute are traditional, if I may call it, which is TNM and fixed price and all that. There is a certain part that we will do on outcome, but at the end of it, our clients own their IP. I mean, look, whenever we work for a customer, any IP I, I generate is the customers. Any patents I generate is the customers, right? So therefore, it's but fair that we are we are then paid for it because we have investors to take care of. We've got employees to take care of. So there's this all three stakeholders you should look at. <clears throat> Having said that, there are interesting ways to manage some of this. So one is we're starting to see um, so newer areas like AI, right? And others, when you start off, they will say, let's have some skin in the game. Let's let's do you know kind of a rev share or profit share or outcome based model. And I'm happy to do that. But if you're doing an engineering of a plant, right? I really can't be on an outcome based model because I can do the engineering design, but I'm not doing the construction and I'm not doing the procurement. So, so there will be traditional models and there'll be outcome based models. And we will play with, you know, work on both of these. At the end of it, we want to unlock value for our customers. At the same time, be fair to our investors and our employees. On the AI side of things, I would hmm. imagine contracts will be fairly small right now, but can you give us one or two examples of the most interesting kind of work that you're doing? It'll give us a sense of what sure. your customers want from AI. Sure. So I'll talk about one engineering example and one uh, manufacturing example. So on the engineering side, we've actually got involved with a particular client uh, where they want to leverage AI and Gen AI, and they would like to look at parts catalogs available globally and then decide which country to source from and also then link the manufacturing supply chain to it completely right as a um, and that we are actually just finishing up now it's been it's been a total of more than about I guess about 25 30 people working for about the last six nine months. <laughs> And um, they've been prompt engineers, they've been uh, decision support engineers. Uh, we've got some probability experts into it to build the algorithm. <clears throat> and then we switched out the LLMs two times while we were doing that work for them. So that's been one. And uh, uh, that's been interesting. On the manufacturing side, uh, we've actually worked on uh, a digital twin thread, leveraging AI uh, for one of our uh, our clients in the chemical sector and we will show that to you downstairs the one of the pods when you tour our facilities we will show it to you uh, and that's been very interesting for us because we've been able to improve uh, uh, we've been able to reduce downtime uh, we've been able to improve their their training of their employees of of managing the shop floor we've actually been able to help them with two shutdowns and reduce the time for shutdown so tangible benefits Right, that they can relate to and say, yes, this is what you did and this is what helped. In fact, I was with 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 uh, with the gentleman that uh, um, that we did it, whose refinery we did it for, and uh, and we had gone for something else. I was in Houston. We met with him, and he said, you know, I remember you guys, and this is not done now. This is done about a year ago, and completed. So so very deep in terms of you know being able to address that and the one thing he mentioned was that you've been able to help me he said it and i i didn't i had not marked it he said you've helped improve my safety record as well mm. and in the context of ai and automation again you've told us that you're beginning to see that sort of linear relation between revenue and headcount is now changing maybe even diverging yes. um, if you throw the story forward five years um, from the corner office vantage point, uh, how do you see it playing out? I mean, well, point. Look, I again, um, I'll say this, and again, I'm going to say that don't hold me to this one, right? But we are 1.2 billion, 27,000 people. 2 billion may not need 50, we may be able to do it in 44, 40, 40 42 uh, as well. 
So there is stuff on AI that is changing stuff. So <clears throat> I'll tell you, on the software-defined life cycle, right? Development times, we've been able to shrink by about 20%. Testing times, we've been able to shrink by 45-50%. Wow, that's stunning. Right? So there was one, I was in Mysore and I was meeting uh, our medical team. And um, so a young lady comes up and she's explaining what she's doing. I said, okay, so how many people do you have? What are you doing? Said, I'm doing development and then I'm doing testing. Said, how big is your team? She said, well, Amit, I had about 80 engineers and now I've got like 15. I said, what happened? Did they resign? 15 or 18, she said, or 20, she said. She said, no, I don't need them. And she was one of the first ones that, that actually implemented AI completely into a project. So what, I, so what we've done is, I've gone back to our engineering delivery managers and I've said, why don't you start implementing it in your work? One thing is marketing talk, you keep on talking about it, one thing is implement and see what happens. So there are areas you're figuring out that you can't do AI also, right? There are parts of the software-defined life cycle towards the development part of the requirement gathering piece which you cannot leverage AI for right now. Maybe 10 years down, something else will evolve, it will happen, right? May happen, but not right now. But once you got the requirements, the development piece of it, right? Reusing some of these algorithms, etc. And then the test piece of it, and from test generate, script generation to writing, I don't want to get technical with you, but the entire test cycle, huge impact in terms of what can be done. So it'll be very interesting to watch. Mm. And so look, the only thing, and that's why I told you, you know, purposeful agile engineering. Unless we are agile, unless we can preemptively see this is coming, it'll become a problem. Therefore, uh, you know, we went last quarter on a limb and I said that we will invest. Our margins will potentially go down slightly, but it'll come back. Right? It happened in COVID. COVID, the, the time COVID hit, our margins went down, but we invested. We invested in an EV lab. We invested in a retraining workforce, setting up the Global Engineering Academy, and the margins came back. We went from 14.x to about 18.x before acquiring Smart World, at which point together the business now is at about, was at about 70. Now we have come down, but we'll go back up. There is an investment period. So it's not just AI, Gen AI. There is parts in, see, I'm talking very easily about the fact that we are working on, you know, uh, zero discharge, we are working on energy transition, etc. But this requires a lot of capabilities to be rebuilt in the company. It requires people to be retrained. There are people being sent to MIT. There are people being sent to various colleges globally. It's all money. See, we are spending between one and a half to two percent of our revenues every year into R&D efforts to make sure we are relevant. So the one thing I'm fairly certain of is that first because of the LNT heritage that we've got that keeps on, keeps us telling us be relevant, stay relevant, and the second the ability of the LTTS DNA if you ask me to continue to continuously innovate, I can assure you that you know the biggest fear actually we have is will we be left behind by our technology piece, and therefore that forces us to continue to look at newer areas, newer frontiers, etc. Before they become mainstay, we will start investing in it. So when it becomes mainstay, we are there to be able to take care of the uh, work to be done in that area. So there is huge amount of retraining being done. A global engineering academy is, I mean, at least is touching 60% of the workforce in some shape or form every year. To bring you back to your point about going from 1.2 to 2.5 or $2 billion company with fewer people, uh, will that also mean that therefore you can potentially be a more profitable company or will your customers ask you for a bigger share of what you're saving? See, there's always a fine line. Like I said, three, three, you have to be fair to all three stakeholders, right? Mm -hmm. Medium term, 2 billion revenue, 17 to 18% EBIT. And then we'll see where we go from there. Mm -hmm. You are, in some ways, you are at the ground zero of the world's biggest tech market. Um, uh, broadly, can you give us a sense of uh, what's the sentiment you're seeing in terms of uh, technology spending amongst your biggest customers and what you see around you sure. in the industry? So, so technology spends happening across the board and I will, I'll give you a slightly detailed answer, right? So at a very broad level, there is technology spend happening. 
as long as you can help improve the top line of the client, improve the, or the bottom line, or improve reliability, operations of operations, etc. If you're working on one of these, there is work to be done. My own pipeline today is 2x as opposed to what it was same time last year. Mm. Right? The number of 25 million deals that we're chasing, the number of 50 million deals we're chasing, the number of 100 million deals we're chasing is higher than where it was one year ago, two years ago, three years ago, one quarter ago. Right? Having said that, where are they spending? So number one, they are looking at uh, they are looking at AI, automation, digital thread, etc. in sustainability in a big way. And we are seeing a number of projects and work happening in that area. Second, they are spending on energy transition. right? So that is your sustainability part. Tech continues to spend on compute. New chips, uh, new software being written, uh, data analytics, product platform engineering, etc. So that's happening. And in the mobility area, software defined machines and vehicles. And in EV, value engineering efforts. How can you be cheaper, faster, better than, you know, say a Chinese model or whatever. So that's broadly the contours along with digital manufacturing that we are seeing today. Hmm. Even a Few months back, you said that from the current quarter onwards, and correct me if I'm wrong, you, I think you hinted that sequential growth as well will come back. Uh, I said that at the end yeah. of quarter one. Right. And mm -hmm. I maintain that, uh, that, um, that quarter two onwards, you will see growth happening across, secular growth happening. Mm. And one is the market, I believe, is, is holding, though it's a tight market. And second, because we've segmentized the company, we've got new set of broad shoulders that are uh, that are taking the load and going deeper uh, uh, to meet our, going deeper to scale, them, meeting our clients a lot more, etc. So I'm seeing a lot more action, if you ask me. Mm. My expectation is that the compute required for Gen AI will continue to expand and will, in the near medium term, require continued uh, focus. A, B is that the need for engineers will continue to be there, not going anywhere, not being replaced by Gen AI or AI. If anything, will go up, right? That's broadly how I see it. Okay. Um, over the next 12 to 18 months, um, what, what might be your top priorities? Just to bring it back to LTTS. So, next 12 to 18 months, uh, top priorities. So, we're saying, you know, we'd like to be $2 billion in the medium term, 17 to 18% EBIT. That's going to require work, right? Medium term is which year? We are not giving a year. Okay. Right? Um, take medium term as medium term. And we'll, sure. of course, it cannot be 10 years down the line. Of it's course. have to be reasonable here, right? So, medium term. Um, <clears throat> But uh, my top priorities are to make sure that we are able to take these 18 areas that we've talked about across three segments, put a governance in place to make sure that we are able to continue to invest in these, which includes AI, includes Gen AI, software defined everything, etc. So continue to do that, so number one, and be a technology partner of choice for our customers. Number two will be that uh, we will continue to look at inorganic means uh, for growth, uh, and we'll continue to evaluate various possibilities that are there. Uh, because we want to, you know, take these three segments to a billion each. So we'll need that to take it forward. Um, third <coughs> uh, is uh, to make sure that uh, we are able to co-create value by closing some of the larger deals that are there in the pipeline, right? Uh, we will have to do. So that's, that's the third item. Um, fourth, continue to be closer to clients, right? Because uh, and, and this client advisory council really helps us. But uh, but more important than that, continue to be close uh, in the geo, right? Uh, uh, and do that across not just me but the entire management team with the clients, etc. Uh, and fifth is uh, uh, this talent academy that we have started. We have started a new track for tech uh, tech track for some of our employees. We have started uh, to work on women in tech. We run about 20% uh, uh, women in our workforce. I'd love to take it to 30% because I believe it's, it'll help us in the future as an organization. So those will be some of the priorities that I continue to work on.